This is the Rock and Roll Autopsy Podcast. I'm Scott. Hey, this is Rico. All right. Today we are each going to talk about a record that we love. I've picked a record that I love and you've picked one that you love. We got 30-ish minutes. We're going to spend about 15 each um, just telling one another why we love these records. And the beauty of the more I thought about this, the, the more I loved it because we really come from our, our when we learned about love and music is from really two different places. And these albums are really, really different, like yin and yang of each other. And that's what's so awesome about this is that they are super different and I can't wait to talk about it. But they both come from, we're talking what, 94, 95 ish. So That's we're right. in the heart mid nineties of nineties rock alternative era. And my first choice for tonight is a record that I know you're not overly familiar with. It's a record that I absolutely adore. It is Danzig 4P. Yeah. Uh, released in what? 1994. We're talking about the fourth record in Danzig's solo career. So I guess to kind of like frame this in a way where I can explain what makes this record unique and different, I have to take, I have to kind of zoom out and take a look at his career a little bit. So let me kind of lay that out a little bit. So we're talking about a dude who is in a punk band called the misfits that does like basically Ramones kind of punk rock with like a rockabilly Elvis Presley, like vocals on it. Super big choruses pivots from that to what is like a Gothic uh, punk band called Sam Hain, which is really kind of atonal and challenging to listen to almost like anti-music a lot of times i love that band as well and then that iteration gets signed by rick rubin and he moves some things around and it becomes the solo outfit danzig that then has the you know we all know the mother hit from the radio it's more blues rock based really the only the only danzig song that i that i knew before this yeah album everybody knew that song his mother and that's it it and, blew up in the 90s and the 90s was a, a decade of alternative rock and and danzig became a brief kind of buzz band on mtv with that alternative rock movement yep. of you know henry rollins and all that kind of stuff so, of that so let me ask you a question then sure um so i i th- this album i i I only listened to it once. I listened to it once this week, just so that I can get a feel of what you're talking about. But I, I know from what I've read, and you're right, this is not Danzig and Misfits and Sam Hain and all that stuff is not. I don't hate that music. It's never been in my 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 uh, repertoire, if you will. Um, so that was a good album to pick. But I read that. Um, it became Danzig. Was you say Bob Rock got involved? Uh, Rick, Rubin. Rick, Rub- Rick Rubin yep. got involved and he, it became Glenn Dadzik so that he could have creative control. Um, was it his intention during most of Sam Hain to, to take this route that this album takes? Why do you think he, I mean, you know what I'm saying? Because Sam Hain is really a far cry, a far distance from this album, from, from the stuff that I've listened to. It seemed that way anyways. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think it was always a progression. Like, I think he, I think the Misfits evolved from the rockabilly stuff to basically early hardcore. And then Sam Hain, it just was a natural evolution to the more goth kind of stuff. And then the, a lot of those later Sam Hain tracks were reworked for the first, you know, more blues based Danzig stuff. I think it was just a natural gotcha. kind of, I see it in the way I see it. I just see it as a natural evolution over time. Um, it's not jarring to me because I'm so familiar with the history and right. I kind of hear hints of what's to come and everything, if that makes sense. So why, why should I like this? Out? Why should I listen to this? And why do you like it so much? Well, I can only really tell you why I like it so much. Yeah. I, I think it is kind of, I don't think it's a listen that anybody could grab onto. Um, 
this is produced by Rick Rubin. Rick Rubin has kind of like, in my opinion, a signature production style that was evident during a window of time in the 90s um, that he's kind of famous for. And this record, to me, is a perfect example of that. Um, I love the vibe of this record. The first Danzig solo record produced by Rubin is super dry. There's very little bass on it. It's got a lot in common production wise with like Injustice for All, you know, and I'm not really a fan of the sound of that record. He improves with the production on every subsequent release. And to me, this is the last record that Ruben produced and the best one. Okay. I love the sound of it. I love the way the guitars sound. I love where the bass sits in the mix. I love the way the vocals are mixed up front. <clears throat> but my favorite part is the way the drums sound in this record. I love Chuck Biscuit's performance. I love the way it sounds. There's space, there's a looseness to all the drums. There's so in much. It. I, I can tell you. Just from the one list, and I, I, I have a couple of things that I want to say as you're going along here with regard to the drums. They're super atmospheric. It, and like some of the songs, the slower songs where he's he's on the ride cymbal and just like... Tss, 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 tss. I agree. The drums were amazing. Yeah, they're real open sounding yes. and they do have an atmosphere and a looseness to it. Yeah. And when I think of that, like I'm thinking of what he does on Little Whip. I love the way the drums are approached on the song Can't Speak, where they sound almost like they're so slow and loose that they sound like they could fall apart, like he's going to lose time at some point, yeah. but doesn't. And I love the fact that you're kind of hanging on when you're listening to it. Like, is this going to go off the rails a little bit here? But it doesn't. Yeah. Um, and, you know, when you're talking about a, uh, a Ruben production, you know, um, he has like this, this kind of, uh, you hear it on other Ruben records of that time. You hear it on the Trouble record, Manic Frustration. To me, this record has a lot of sonic similarities to that one. Even the Tom Petty record that he did at that time. There's a warmness to it, a real analog kind of quality to it that I just love the sound of this It record. does kind of sound like you're listening to vinyl when you're listening to that. That's really yeah. a good description of yep. it. Yeah, and other things... The track Going Down to Die, I think it's a signature track on the record. It was written for Oliver Stone's film, Natural Born Killers, didn't get picked up for the movie. But it's got an incredible vocal performance. The riff is kind of a direct lift off of Freebird. It's almost like the Freebird riff. But it, it works in this song. It's got this, it's got really cool lyrics to it. It's again the third verse. It has this breakdown. There's tons of atmosphere. Glenn's voice kind of soars into like Cookie Monster territory a little bit on the choruses, but it's forgivable. It does on Little Whip too, but it's forgivable. That that little growly thing that he's got yeah. when he hits the higher yeah. notes, it slides into that Cookie Monster <laughs> world, right. and you kind of like start to be like. Eh. And these are the things that he's made fun of for. I mean, he's a guy who's there's memes about him. He's made. He's often. You know, there he is a caricature of himself. And this is kind of in an era before he became that. And as a Danzig fan, you kind of always have to like check that, you know, there is an element of his music that is corny and cheesy. And you have to kind of be like, well, how serious am I supposed to take this stuff? You know what I mean? So there's always this is a pretty serious record. I do think that it's it's earnest. I do think I don't think that he's. Um, I, one, I honestly don't think that he's aware of how cheesy he is at times. No, I don't think I, he has that level of self-awareness. But I agree. The 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 one time that I listened to this this week, I I <clears> got <throat> that impression that he was he was all in and he was super serious on this album. And, <laughs> yeah. I mean it, and it's it's so drippy and and I and it yeah. There's no way that he's aware of just how over serious he's taking this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And as a listener, you kind of have to decide: Am I going to not get the joke, or is there a joke? Am I taking this as serious as he does? I just enjoy the record. I don't get caught up in this stuff. Yeah. You know, I I'm aware enough to know that that he's a cheesy caricature, but I also can respect the fact that I think he's a brilliant songwriter. And I don't really care what Planet Earth thinks of him otherwise. Um, Little Whip. This, the first track, Brand New God. Let's go there. 
This is right back to the Misfits. The full-on chugging guitars, the woes, the buzzsaw guitar element. It's a, it's like, oh my gosh, he's, we're back in the Misfits again. It's got yeah. all those elements in place. It's amazing to hear. But now we're hearing it with, we never heard Misfits songs with good production. You know, <laughs> right. Now we're hearing that produced really well. It's got this cool breakdown in the middle. Can I just say that? I, I <clears> love <throat> the way it's mixed. <clears throat> the production quality on this album, I thought it was pretty pretty awesome actually yeah it's it, i love it and then it follows up with little whip and this is like glenn's always been accused of oh you're a jim morrison ripoff this is him doubling down on that is it's this got, the one with like that tremolo guitar thing going on it sounds like that's a, that's another that's dominion later but this one almost sounds like five to one by the doors you yeah, know and it's got that vibe to it and yeah yeah so it's a combination this song is like a combination of five to one by the doors and bullet the blue sky by u2 and it's got and it's got this huge atmospheric kind of breakdown section. Again, the drums are super loose. You're just wondering, is he going to fall off keeping time? Yeah. Followed up by Can't Speak. We talked about that one already going down to die. I'm not going to go down the entire track list, but I'll just kind of pull some things out. This record is creatively adventurous. You know, Glenn and the other things, it's like when he was doing the Misfits, it was the Misfits. And it was kind of one thing. Sam Hain. Tons of adventure, tons of chances taken, really kind of creatively challenging, you know, atonal. Reels it in with Danzig. You're talking about blues rock. It gets real simple, real basic, real bluesy for like three records. And now on this record, we're back to like that Sam Haynes spirit of taking chances again. So we've got jazzy moments and, and Son of the Morning Star. Sadistical sounds like a John Carpenter track. You know, we're taking chances again musically. It's a really adventurous Danzig album. There's there's a sense of like creative exploration on this record that I love. It's got balls. It's daring. Not balls. And this album isn't really overly heavy. There's a lot of like really clean crooning Elvisy vocals on it. You know, some of this stuff, I feel <clears throat> like I'm watching like an old Sergio Leone Western or something. It does it's have super cool. Yeah, it does have that feel to it. Yeah. You, know? you mentioned the tremolo and the guitars yeah. give you that impression, you know. Um, so it, it's just the record has like just some themes around it to where he's just re-embracing punk. It's got the vocal hooks, you know, um, it's got the song can't speak has this guitar riff on it. This kind of arpeggiated chord thing. And then for the last track, which is a ballad, let it be captured. They're both the ballads on the record. He just took that chord progression and played it backwards. So it's the exact same chord progression played backwards, but he wrote a whole nother song. It's completely different and doesn't sound it. They don't sound anything alike. And it's like just a creative inversion of the chord progression, the exact same riff just flipped and entirely different vocal melodies applied over top. And you have an, 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 a totally new song. It's just really cool kind of um, creative and like, utilitarian way to like mine your your catalog of riffs you know and get the most out of them you know i like the idea of being able to take simple ideas and get mileage out of them you're not just casting them aside you know right um i don't mind the pain great track there are a few songs in this track who, that should have and could have been hits it's going down the die can't speak i don't mind the pain maybe dominion they have big vocal hooks in the choruses you know that danzig can write choruses he can write music he's written songs for johnny cash roy orbison these guys sing his songs because these guys are great songwriters themselves who know when a song is crafted well and written well and it's here on this record these are all really well thoughtful songs and again, in the spirit of weirdness and creativity, it's got this hidden track at the end that is like a, a seance, this invocation track, which is just super creepy and atmospheric. It, it works on Halloween. It's it's like you almost feel like you shouldn't be listening to it. It's just it's <laughs> it's really cool. And just a couple before I wrap here and let you uh, let you take over. It's got a couple little weird fun things about it too. Um, if you Danzig is just a he's a quirky guy and he's a conspiracy theorist. At the time, he was convinced that the FBI had files on him, like they did John Lennon. And so, if you when you get the 
Danzig 4P album and you open up the album art, there's this image of Bill Clinton shaking the hands of a man with a rifle and Glenn Danzig and his three bandmates are all in coffins. And <laughs> so, <he's, laughs> nice. so Glenn, you know, uh, you know, he's imagining that, you know, he believed that Bill Clinton wanted him dead. And this, so it's like he's he's all in on the conspiracy. Probably stuff. Tipper Gore, yeah. if anybody, right? <laughs> yeah. And then I also, um, this is like the last album of the classic lineup of Danzig. The, this After this, Danzig would no longer work with Rick Rubin. He fired the entire band. And he got signed to Hollywood Records, which was owned by Disney. And once Disney found out they had signed the Prince of Satan to their album, they quickly <laughs> jettisoned him. And he never had another home on a label ever again. So everything he put out after that had to be put out independently. So his days of having a home on a major label were done. And he never, in my opinion, got back to being this great again. Everything he did after this was never as good, a lot of it really bad. And that this marked kind of the end of what I viewed as like a clear ascension all the way through Misfit Sam Hain to Danzig 4. And after this, it was never, never the same. And creatively, he was never as good. So this was the creative peak. The, his was, creative peak. It was downhill from here. So well, I can tell you that um, and like I said, I only listened to it once. I'm not qualified to dig deep like like you just did but i can say that i wasn't sure how it was going to feel about this because i had no idea what it was going to sound like but i really liked it actually i thought it was super drippy and vibey and all the stuff that you like it for i liked it for the same yeah, reason just gobs and gobs of vibe and atmosphere and just and I there's nothing for all like of those reasons you know there's elements of it that are spooky there's elements of it that rock mm. but it's got a consistent tone and it and also the nice thing about it now is that i can look back on it 20 odd years later and listen to it and a lot of records that I used to love, I, I can identify that they haven't aged well or that this record still sounds great. It doesn't sound dated. It doesn't sound like of the 90s. You know, there's some kind of signature 90s sounds that we identify. I feel like it's still the strongest record in his solo catalog and um, and holds up really, really well. So my favorite uh, Danzig record, and that's my choice to talk to you about. Danzig today. 4. Well, Danzig 4. I'm glad that I know about that because, like I said, I actually, when I listened to it, I liked it. I wasn't sure what I was going to think, and, and uh, I like it, so I'm glad glad to know about that now. So if, if, uh, if there ever was a yang to Danzig's yin, <laughs> it would be the presidents of the United States of America. Um, I am a giant fan of them. Um, most people know the song Lump. Yep. Um, huge hit. Peaches was their other giant hit. Huge. They did um, um, Cleveland Rocks for the Drew Carey Show, which, by the way, they didn't do that song for the Drew Carey Show. He picked it up. You know, Drew Carey's from around Northeast Ohio, too. They actually did that song, and then he picked it up afterwards and put it on his show. So, um, oh, wow. they did I that didn't on, know that. Yeah, true, true. I thought they, that was like a commission to perform. No, definitely not. So they were just covering Cleveland Rocks for shits and giggles. And, and on their final album. That is what, so fun. And their, yeah, and on their final album that I'm not going to talk about, they actually do another song about Ohio. So oh, they wow. have two songs about Ohio. And do you know where they're from? Uh, I do. So, they're, so uh, Chris Ballou, bass player, and all three of them are from the Seattle area. Um, Chris, okay. Yeah, Chris Ballou and... Um, uh, to dare her, gosh, I can't remember his first name. Let me look it up here. I got it in my notes. Uh, I just it just escaped me for a second. Oh, uh, hold on here. Dave to dare, yeah, Dave to dare and Chris Blue met in school. They formed a punk band, and it was just the two of them without a drummer. And they just were around on the on the side on the uh, sidewalk and streets playing punk for donations, right. Like oh, you wow. see, you see a lot of that now, Yeah, but you didn't, that didn't really happen back in, back when in the 1991 when they hooked up. Right. So then they met the drummer, Jason Finn, who was the drummer throughout the, throughout the band. Right. So before they met Jason Finn, they were a punk band and a lot of the stuff that they did while it was just the two of them wound up being songs while they were the presidents. Hmm. So they came out with this album in 1995. Um, self-titled album. 
Can I pause you for a minute? Sure. You're kind of laying out who's in the band and who does what. Yeah. My, my memories of them are from seeing their videos. And aren't they like, are they, are they a three piece? They are a three piece. Chris Ballou's the singer. But doesn't want to. Okay. So they're a three piece mm-hmm. and, and the singer's playing a g- guitar. Well, here's what's interesting. Because they only guys. have two strings. <laughs> yeah. So, and it's not even a bass guitar. He, he plays a Fender, a Strat. With two bass strings on it, super heavy gauge strings, and there's only two of them. One is D and the other one is G, I believe. Okay. So he plays a two-string bass guitar that he calls a a, a git bass. Hmm. And uh, Dave Dadera played a guitar, and it only had three strings on it. Okay. And he called that a bass guitar. So and between two guitar players, they have, they have five, five strings, strings five but strings. neither but the guitars are kind of both guitars and basses. That's or no, correct. one of them is a, a a guitar strung with bass strings. Yeah, Chris Ballou had a Fender with bass strings on it. Wow. And they were super heavy. They were tuned yeah, down. Jack to, up the neck? Well, I guess he had it probably tuned down he, they, so far. C-sharp. put the tension on the neck. Yeah, they, had, hmm. they were tuned all the way down to C-sharp. Oh, right. wow. Yeah. And so, between, and they, did, they actually got the idea from... Um, a band called morphine if you, did you yeah that's like the band where it's like a three-piece and like there's no guitar in a band it's like a saxophone player and a bass player and a drummer right yeah so morphine's terrific I chris blue actually worked with the front man mark sandman yeah i think, and he's, he got I think the, he's deceased now yeah, yeah. and he got yeah. the he got the idea of stringing their guitars up like this from him oh interesting. they had worked together and, yeah. he, and he got the idea from so yeah they he did two strings for most of the time Almost like uh like that's kind of like from cigar box guitar land where they yeah. have like you're playing three string instruments. It's almost like a throwback to yeah. like old blues. Right. And and in fact, it's funny you say that because a lot of the gosh, there's rock in this in this album, there's rockabilly in this album, hmm. and there's some punk in this album too. And it's super cool. It, and they've got this the way you know with the two string bass and the three string guitar and the way they have their amp set up it gives it this really cool fuzzy vintage sound yeah with just enough crunch to give it some substance yeah not super overdriven more like just some natural kind yeah of and it, it, it's, it's the setups are great yeah and i great, totally love them great warm tones on yeah the, on for the sure sounds. so the, the the reason why i love this band so much is the creativity of the lyrics i mean the music's great the, they they've got this awesome blend like i said of rockabilly and punk and rock but and I've never been a really big lyrics guy. You know, I, I grew up with big band music and and sometimes it was mostly instrumental. And, and then I went from that to jazz and there's no really singing in the instrumental jazz that I listened to. And then I played music in school. and There's no singing. So I really listened to a lot of instrumental type music. So that's one thing that's different about me and you is lyrics mean a lot more to you than they do to me. Yeah, but I did just defend Danzig Four, so I mean, it's like, you know, there's some good lyrics on that, but you know. But you pay attention. I'm, I'm being cheeky. Yeah, but I, I you, but you pay yeah. attention to lyrics a lot more than I do. Sure. Yeah. But the beauty of this album is, is they're 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 the his lyrics are so fun. He talks about like the first song is about his a pet cat that he had. It's called Kitty, another yeah. one of their famous songs, and he talks about bugs that he sees in the yard and he talks about little blue dune buggies and on another album Mach so, 5 is about a little toy car that they that he explodes sounds just like observational stuff uh, it's, like it, everyday it, life just observational every, it, things it's ex- yeah. it, exactly and the funny thing about it is he <laughs> i always thought that his lyrics were super heavily nuanced with because if you listen to him they are loaded with funny ass metaphors mm-hmm. loaded with them and there's actually a couple of couple of places on this album where um, they pay homage, you know, and and the, specifically the album that it is the tenth anniversary edition because there's some extra stuff on there. Um, they throw the original album on there, which I'll talk about here in a second. But then they also have um, 
a couple of other songs from other albums. One of them is called Fuck California. Hmm. I don't know if you've ever heard that. I have not. It's it's awesome because it's basically Booker T and the MG's Green Onions kind of repackaged a little bit. Oh, wow. And he even mentions Green Onions in there, too. Yeah. So there's a little bit of Booker T in that song. There's a song in the original that has a little bit of um, I Got a Feeling from the Beatles hmm. at the end. I'll, I'll in, uh so they pay, and there's another song that kind of sounds like The Doors. It's called um, um, Stranger. Yeah. My favorite song on this album is Stranger, and it's very low-key and quiet. It's about a set of vignettes on a guy who has this silly crush on a girl and how you kind of lose your shit when you want to talk to her. Yeah. But you just you just kind of lose your mind. and then hum -no, hum -no, hum -no. Exactly. Yeah. So that's my favorites. But the lyrics are so heavily laden with metaphors he actually did an interview about that, and he actually said that 80% of his lyrics are exactly what you said, just observational yeah. stuff, and that he's not really comfortable with all the innuendo, double entendre stuff that people think are in his lyrics. I don't necessarily think I believe that, though, because if you listen to some of this stuff, like the Peaches song, for example, yeah. the one section in Peaches, I'm not going to sing it because I'm a terrible singer, but he talks about took a little nap in a room I saw twist, squished a rotten peach in my fist, and dreamed about you, woman. Poked my finger down inside, make a little room for an ant to hide, nature's candy in my hand or a can or a pie. Now, if you think about that. <laughs> That's really well written. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me there isn't sexual innuendo, oh, yeah. and it's yeah. loaded with it's it, right? It's right there, yeah. Yeah, he kind of, he kind of, shies away from that and i think here's why because a lot of his side shit he did kids out he wound up doing kids albums actually yeah so under the name of casper baby pants and he did some side <laughs> yeah i've listened to it actually it really just sounds like the president's yeah. except without the sexual innuendo right that's funny i mean there's a song in there about um a rocker who overdoses on drugs and goes to hell yeah but the way they package it and the way they 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 load it up with metaphors the the rocker is actually he called a froggy jumped all over the stage that day and froggy is just like this loaded up rocker that ods on drugs so he the, it's the way they package this these kind of metaphoric things that they're talking about mm -hmm. that glenn dads it could make scary as shit but they make it silly and funny and they and, and when you combine the way they do these metaphors and the lyrics with the phenomenal creativity with five strings, the right. shit they do with five strings on this album is awesome, dude. And the, the way they're combining the rockabilly and the punk and the rock together. And it's, it's just so much fun. I can't listen to this album and be in a bad mood. I, I love a couple things that you're, you're touching on. If you can give me a little room to kind of branch out on that, but you know, as far as like a consumer of lyrics, I've evolved a little bit. You know, when I was in high school, I, I thought that anything that talked about sex or, you know, drugs or rock and roll was stupid and that you had to be talking about politics, you know, or like the destruction of the planet to be writing good lyrics. You know what I mean? It had to be like, you know, Eye of the Beholder by Metallica was brilliant lyrics, but, you know, anything that Bon Scott wrote wasn't, you know, or David Lee Roth, right? And I, but I've really evolved on that over the years to where now I can kind of appreciate the street poetry of some of these guys and how clever they were to turn a phrase, mm -hmm. you know, and that, that passage you quoted from Peaches it's just really creatively well written. You know, lump, it's just lump lingered last in line for brains, and the one she got was sort of rotten and insane. Small things so sad that birds could land is lump fast asleep or rocking out with the band. Yeah, it's poetry, man. It's, it's awesome, it's man. Really... And it's so much fun to listen to. Yeah. You can't and, and which is hard for you. I know you can't have fun. Especially, I'm a huge Ramones fan. <laughs> ACDC is fun. Um, I, I'm just joking around. But no, I, but if but, if you, I mean, it's it's better than taking uppers. Let's just listen to some presidents. Yeah. It, it, so I love where you're coming from with the lyric thing because yeah. you're right and really great writing and the examples you cite are perfect. I mean, it's hard to listen to you not sing those and recite those and realize that oh my gosh, it's just really well written and cleverly constructed phrasing. You know. Um, 
the other thing it's I just like to kind of riff on for a quick second is that when I think of this band, I'm not overly familiar with their catalog. I know what was on the radio at the time and on MTV like everybody else does. But it's evident that they were really great songwriters, you know, and that they could write a hook, right? Yeah, yep. And I like the fact, I like the idea of minimalism and the fact that they're purposely kind of like hamstringing themselves by saying, we're going to alter our instruments. So we're putting limitations of what we can do. There aren't going to be, there's going to be no sweep picking in our songs, right? We, <laughs> yeah, no, none of that on this Yeah, album. we're not going to be able to write like really involved, convoluted, long musical passages because we've limited what we can actually do with our instruments. But in doing so, it like forces you to be creative in like a different way. It's like you're getting a set of rules and you're saying, and I, I forgive me, but I always use ACDC for this example. It's like, okay, you can only use three chords. You can only use one drum beat. Every lick you play has to come from the minor pentatonic <laughs> and the song has to be three minutes long. Go write a hit that'll last forever. Yeah. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh shit. Well, I can play a 4-4 and I know three chords and I know the minor pentatonic, but you're telling me to go write a hit that'll last forever. It's like you don't appreciate how difficult that is and what a monumental achievement it is. If you give someone every crayon in the box and tell them to go be creative, it sounds a lot less challenging, doesn't it? Then so if you give them three and say, now come up with something really great. Right. And it feels yeah. like to me, that's kind of like where they operate from. And it's like that, that punk rock, you know, work ethic of, you know, we're going to simplify, we're going to strip things down. We're only taking with us what's necessary. Yep. You know, that's a fact. So yeah, I feel like this is one of my favorite albums. Um, I love listening to it. I, I can't, I get, I move around. I'm, I'm a little bit quicker on the draw when I listen to this album. It puts me in a good mood. So it's immensely and tremendously creative, both sonically and lyrically. And uh, I think everybody who likes really good music ought to give either one of these albums a try because they're both great, in my opinion. But I thought, I think Danzig 4, I really liked it a lot. Um, and Pusa is one of my favorites. So go check them out. Thanks for listening. See ya. Let me have that special rock and roll music. Yeah! Let me tell you, so the lyrics to real rock music is nothing more than satanic cyanide. Get it out of your house, throw it out, and burn it. It has no place in the house of the righteous. You guys, it was like a mistake. There's no mistake anymore. Oh, to the door, love it hey, to the morning. I'm gone. I'm gone. Follow us on Twitter at RNR Autopsy, or you can send an email to rock and roll autopsy at gmail.com. And if we run across anything good, we'll mention it in a future episode. Thanks for listening. Later. <laughs>